Welcome back everyone. It's been an exciting week for us because of the first open auto video which got a lot of hits and a lot of really great questions. And while this project is a little off topic for our channel, I hope our regular subscribers will hang in there even if this isn't of interest to you. Boring! I'm leaving! Unsubscribing! Just us then. And for all of our new subscribers, thanks so much for joining us. I hope you'll check out some of our earlier videos where I've shown how we built our custom 4x4 off-road adventure camper, if that's of any interest to you. Well, let's dig right into it. The day after I posted that last video, I received the HDMI to camera cable ribbon adapters in the mail and immediately plugged it all in using the 30-foot uh, HDMI cable I got from Amazon. But sadly, nothing worked. It just gave the error that no camera was connected. So I went to my local computer shop and bought this 35 foot cable. And fortunately I could take everything with me and plug it in there and prove it worked before I bought it. So that's the one I'm using. I did still have some problems with the video feed, even with the new cable. It would show these purple flickering scan lines. But once I reseated the connectors, it seemed to smarten up and I got a nice crisp feed. This is the view from the new fisheye cameras that I got in. As a side note, I ordered two sets of these camera adapters, just in case one set was defective or arrived damaged, or I broke one. But uh, I don't need both sets, so if any of you are building something similar and you need these, let me know in the comments and I'll uh, get those out to you. So one of the questions that I got over and over was how do you connect the power from your vehicle to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, in the last video I showed the DC to DC converter that cuts the 12 volts down to 5 volts, but some people didn't know how to connect it to their car. So here goes. The simplest way to do this would be to tap into the constant 12 volt power and switched ignition wires which are already behind your car stereo and are relatively easy to access. This is the wiring harness that adapts my Kenwood stereo to the vehicle's original factory harness. These are pretty common when installing aftermarket head units because it allows you to make a custom adapter between your vehicle's original harness and the new connector on the aftermarket deck that you've chosen. I've installed many car stereos over the years and the wire colors that you'll need are all the same. Black for ground, yellow for the battery constant voltage, and red for the switched voltage. Many people made comments about my buttons and the rear view camera script. Uh, the buttons I salvaged years ago from some industrial equipment and because our camper truck has a manual transmission and I find that I keep my hand resting right on the shift lever when I'm driving, I wanted to have the buttons located right under my fingertip without needing to look down to find them. So this seemed like a really good spot. I know they look like they're small targets, but with my hand resting right on the shifter, they work pretty good. They almost feel like mouse buttons. I suspect very few of you will choose to mount buttons on your shifter, but the following information applies no matter where you mount them. You can use any momentary switch and mount it wherever you want. Another question we got was how I got the audio out of the Pi and into the car speakers. In my case, it was really simple. I just used a 3.5 millimeter audio cable to connect to the auxiliary input on my Kenwood head unit. This is connected to the USB sound card. Another option would be to use Bluetooth as a Raspberry Pi 3 does have Bluetooth built in, but I tried this with my Kenwood and wasn't having any success. And because I had to run wires anyway, it seemed like just piping it into the auxiliary input was the easiest. I just drilled a small hole right here next to my unit's auxiliary input and ran the cable through the grommet and down to the USB sound card, which is inside here. If you didn't want to drill a hole through your dash, you could probably just sneak the wire through the gap. Rather than trying to show you a tangled mess of wires inside the truck, I've made this tangled mess of wires inside the computer. This will help to visually explain how I've connected the buttons and the power to the Raspberry Pi. Basically the button monitor script is running in a loop, watching for the input pin to be connected to ground. First, let's look at this simplified diagram. As you can see, the Raspberry Pi and a push button switch. One wire is connected to the input pin, and the other wire is connected to the ground pin. When you push the button, it connects the input to ground. Super easy, right? 
Back to our more confusing diagram. As you can see, all three buttons have their grounds connected together, and then they each have a unique wire running to the input pins on the Raspberry Pi, pin 14, 15, and 18. The power supply is a little more complex. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm using these power supply symbols to represent the 12 volt constant power and 12 volt switched accessory power that I mentioned could be found behind your car stereo, and I've kept the wire colors consistent with what you'll likely find on an aftermarket deck black, yellow, and red. In the last video I showed you the DC to DC converter that I recommend. That's represented here by this voltage regulator, and I've also added a master switch and a capacitor. These are somewhat optional, but I'll get to that in a bit. So, on this yellow wire, which we tapped from behind the stereo, there is constantly 12 volts, and it comes through here, through the switch, to the DC to DC converter, where it gets converted from 12 volts to 5 volts. Then, this capacitor smooths out any fluctuations or ripple in the voltage. This helps make up for sudden surges or dips in power, like when the backlight display kicks in and out, for example. It can also help filter out alternator noise, which you might hear in your speakers. So now we have nice, clean, conditioned 5 volt power, just like you would normally get from the micro USB cable. So now we can feed this power into the Raspberry Pi as usual. But instead of going into the micro USB connector, I have mine running into the header pins on the Raspberry Pi, and also straight into the 7-inch touchscreen display. And finally, the optocoupler and push button for the shutdown script. An optocoupler, as the name implies, optically couples two systems together. There is no electrical connection between the input and the output. It uses an internal LED to optically signal the output transistor. So now that you understand that, it's wired pretty much the same way as a button. Pin 4 of the opto is connected to ground, and pin 5 is connected to the input pin on the Raspberry Pi. The input side on the left of the optocoupler needs to be treated like an LED because it is, after all, an LED. So when we want to detect things with high voltage, like 12 volts, or the reverse lights, or any other 12 volt source, you'll need a resistor to bring down the current to a reasonable level for an LED. And that's what this is here. A 680 ohm resistor that cuts down the power so that we don't burn up the LED with too much current. Let's get back to the switch for a second. Since the optocoupler script just puts the Pi to sleep, it still consumes a bit of power when it's not in use. Most car batteries can tolerate this for a while, but if you wanted to save on power, or you're not planning on driving for a few days, or if you have a really weak battery, you could just switch this off after it's shut down, and that will totally cut the power. There must be a better way. And there is. What I've shown you so far is the quick and dirty way. It allows you to quickly connect power, which is easily accessible by just sliding out your head unit and tapping into two wires in your harness. And while that's perfectly acceptable and it works just fine, there is some parasitic draw, which is why I've added that master switch to disconnect all the power if you're not using the vehicle for a while. However, if you want a more elegant, more permanent solution, I can easily modify this diagram to something a bit better. This will, however, require you to dig a little deeper into your dash and find the ignition wire. The easiest way to find information on this would be to look up remote car starters for your make and model of vehicle. There's lots of information online specific to your vehicle. You may also want to check if your cigarette lighter is switched with your ignition, because this would be much easier to tap into. The one catch for this method is that your vehicle will need to be equipped with a delayed accessory feature. This means that when you switch off your ignition and remove the keys, the radio stays on until you open the door or until a timer expires, usually about two minutes. Most vehicles built within the last 15 years will have this. So this more better method uses exactly the same diagram as before, except that we tap into different wires on the car. Instead of powering the DC to DC converter from the 12 volt constant power, we'll change this to be connected to the switched accessory power, or delayed accessory. And instead of using the opto to sense the state of the accessory wire, will sense the state of the vehicle's ignition wire. So now with this new arrangement, as soon as you switch off the ignition, the Raspberry Pi will execute the shutdown script, which in my testing only takes about two or three seconds. So while you're removing your seat belt and disconnecting your phone from the cable, the Raspberry Pi has already shut down. Then when you open the door, the delayed accessory will click off and remove all power from the system. Since your ignition wire probably has a really big fuse, you'll want to have a little fuse very close to the ignition where you've tapped into it. Anything small is fine, since we're only powering a LED in the optocoupler. Now let's get into the code. I've put my little scripts up in GitHub Gists. You can download them just by going to gist.github.com.
com slash everlanders. The backlight script is simple enough. Just download that and place it in your user local bin directory. Do the same for the button monitor .py script. I found the easiest way to do this is to SSH into the Pi and then copy and paste the code using nano. Press Ctrl X to save. Then you need to make both of these scripts executable. Do this by typing chmod plus x backlight.sh and then do it again for button monitor. You can test the script's work by typing dot slash backlight space 128. Enter. The valid choices are 0 to 255, with 128 being in the middle, that would give you 50% brightness on your screen. Everything should be working, right? Before we get into my button monitor script, you should understand some basic raspyvid commands. If you just type raspyvid at the command line, it will display all the possible options, like this. And if we use some of those options, we can see it brings up the camera's display on screen. In this example, I've typed raspyvid minus t 2000. t for time, 2000 milliseconds. So, this command previews the camera's view for two seconds. Now, if we use raspyvid minus t zero, it will show the screen indefinitely until we stop it by pressing control C. Fantastic. One last thing. If we use raspyvid b minus t zero dash vf, it will vertically flip, or if you use dash hf to horizontally flip, you can see how that mirrors the display. You'll need to play with these to flip the camera image so that the rear view camera is mirrored properly, depending on how you install your camera. There, so now that we understand that, we can move on to my script. Basically what's happening here is the script has two counters, one called run and one called bright. And every time it senses that a button has been pressed, it runs one of these blocks of commands and then increases the counter. Here you can see the raspyvid command that it's calling, and at the end of the block, the counter sets to zero to start the count over again. If you want to change any of my video commands, you could do that right here. The brightness works in exactly the same way, but with the bright counter. This block sets the brightness to 255, which is 100%. This one sets it to 128, which is 50%, and lastly, this one sets it to 20, which is about 10%. Great! Now that you sort of have a grasp on that, let's take it for a test run. You can run it by typing dot slash button monitor dot py. Notice each time I press the button, it echoes out a line from the script, and you can see the effect that it has here on the screen. Huzzah! It works! You can press Ctrl C to exit the script. Next, we just need to make sure it automatically starts when the machine starts up. To do that, I've just added a line to the auto start config file by typing sudo nano slash home slash pi dot config slash lx session slash lxde hyphen pi slash auto start. Here you can see the line for the button watcher and another line I've added that launches the open auto application. The shutdown script is taken from HowTo, and I'll put the link to that in the description. I just followed his instructions posted and got everything up and running without needing to modify anything. Basically, that script watches not when the button is pressed, but when it's released. And that's the trick to how the optocoupler senses when the ignition is turned off and then runs the shutdown script. You'll notice that that command isn't executed when I press the button, but when I release it. Okay, so I'll try and give you a little more comprehensive tour this time. Uh, a lot of people are asking how fast the uh, screens are, if there's any latency. Um, I think they're pretty great. Everything seems to move pretty, pretty quickly. Um, now, because I'm filming this with my camera, I've got Kara here, and she's going to issue some voice commands, and then voice commands while the music's playing, interrupting it. There's a lot of people with questions about that. Okay, Google, play I'm So by Andrew Applepie.
you know, directions to somewhere. Okay, Google. Get me directions to Vancouver. Vancouver is 16 hours and 48 minutes from your location by car in light traffic. Okay, Google. What's the temperature outside? In Saskatoon, it's currently minus 3 degrees Celsius. So, even when it's playing music or nav or whatever, I can uh, switch the camera. It's kind of dark back there right now, but you can see how I switch from full screen to to picture in picture and so on. And then I can dim Thanks so much for watching everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. For those of you who are building something like this, I hope you found it useful. If you have any other questions, leave them in the comments and we'll see you next time. Bye. It's been an exciting... Welcome back everyone. Even if this isn't of interest to you. <laughs> Boring. <laughs>